Hello again. We are back at it. We're still talking about the moderate stage or phase of the French Revolution, but things are going to gradually get crazier and crazier, as we'll see. Uh, some of what we'll find by the end of this uh, is almost hard to believe uh, that it could have happened. If you Some of these events, if you read about as a fictional story, I would argue that you think, ah, oh, come on, that's, you know, that couldn't happen. That's, that's unrealistic uh, fiction. But this is uh, not fiction, uh, it's fact. Uh, but uh, we left off here. We didn't get to this yet. The Women's March on Versailles. Uh, and as one author uh, uh, of a really good book on this subject uh, says, one of history's most tangible and dramatic displays of popular sovereignty and marks the end of the age of aristocracy. Uh, it wasn't just women uh, that were on this march, but uh, the uh, I think the majority uh, were. Uh, and uh, the fact that women as an underprivileged group uh, in you know, misogynistic societies um, like Europe's took the, the lead uh, in this to march all the way out to Versailles from Paris and a actually force their way into the uh, palace at Versailles. Some of them sort of screaming and running through the palace trying to find Marie Antoinette. Uh, and they did uh, apparently intend physical harm. A and the royal family was there, but they managed to evade them at such a big uh, palace. And uh, Mar the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, the commander, famous commander of the National Guard, eventually arrived with a contingent of troops and was able to kind of negotiate a uh, uh, a compromise between what became the two sides. The king and queen had a Swiss Guard military protection, as they always did. So uh, he, he was able, uh, Lafayette was able to defuse the situation, but only by getting the royal family, the king and queen, to agree uh, to come back basically kind of under armed guard, this whole group, uh, uh, in a carriage with them back to Paris. So the women uh, revolutionaries, women revolutionaries as a whole, win uh, this round uh, and actually force the the you know, Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette back to uh, to Paris. This just didn't happen in you know uh, uh, earlier history in, in Europe. So uh, this is why F Professor Bell, who I quoted at the bottom, uh, said this marks the end of the age of aristocracy when average people. Uh, right, uh, all these uh, folks here are from the working classes uh, of Paris, maybe some middle class. Uh, but when they can force the king and queen of France uh, uh, to go where they want them to go by threat of force, things have changed. So uh, the royal family forced back uh, to Paris amid a chaotic situation, to put it mildly. Uh, but it was also a sign of decreasing trust in uh, and uh, you know, decreasing confidence in the power of the monarchy. Right, if the monarchy can be, uh, I mean, this must have been humiliating for them. Uh, so uh, this uh, led, I think, to a loss of respect, uh, uh, you know, for them uh, from the public's uh, perspective and perception. It also shows this event that women played an important role in the revolution, and and even well beyond this famous march, women were involved uh, at every step of the way, politically uh, and you know, doing uh, social. Uh, uh, political protest, activism like this, but also uh, involved in uh, politics, at least in indirect ways, played, played a large role. One of the turning points of this whole crisis, at least crisis for the monarchy and for the you know, government of France that existed at the time before this happened, is the flight to Varennes, 1791. Uh, a very bad, bad decision made by the king and queen. Uh, they decided to escape France. They actually dressed themselves to a degree as peasants, uh, got in a carriage, uh, and tried to escape uh, incognito uh, uh, to the uh, Netherlands. Uh, why the Netherlands? Because uh, that part of the Netherlands they were trying to make it to was Habsburg territory. Uh, and uh, Louis, as it says in the uh, picture and map on the left, uh, that uh, he had armies supporting him there. So they weren't intending to leave for good. They were intending to leave so they could get themselves sort of back 
uh, uh, you know, under their own control, not under the watchful eye of the people of Paris. Remember, the, they had just been, uh, uh, our last slide showed them uh, being forced to come back to Paris uh, under an armed uh, and dangerous escort. So uh, it's not that surprising that they tried to make a break for it and get to the border. But the goal, again, was to rally support uh, from outside, from other monarchs. Remember, Marie Antoinette uh, is also the sister of the Austrian emperor. But monarchs, kings, rulers of other countries uh, tended to not like what was happening in France anyway because it was a bad precedent uh, for any king to see a, you know, a neighboring country or any other European country uh, to see their monarchy go down to a, you know, a revolution from below. So they had plenty of supporters, uh, and, and so this wasn't totally unrealistic. But from the perspective, from the PR perspective, optics as they call it now, this uh, wasn't a good look. Uh, you know, if they had gotten away, it wouldn't have been a good look. Uh, but uh, getting caught was a worse look. It made them look incompetent. It made them look cowardly. It made them look uh, dishonest. Uh, and the, the latter is for sure true. Because remember, Louis the Sixteenth was still at this point talking uh, and making statements uh, about support for what the uh, uh, revolutionary government was uh, doing, which, by the way, already had in place uh, the constitution that they'd been writing uh, from the from the beginning. Uh, which moved France in a, in a more democratic direction. So uh, th this uh, it might be that Varenne may have uh, been the beginning of the end uh, for uh, the monarchy, certainly for Louis the Sixteenth uh, as as king. So this does, I think, uh, qualify as a major turning point. To show us uh, that. There really was a threat from outside uh, to the revolution. The revolutionaries uh, were enraged, uh, as much of the populace in, in France was, uh, when they heard the, about the Declaration of Pilnitz, or read it, or had it read to them, or heard about it, uh, when uh, in August of 1791, Austria and Prussia called on Europe to get involved, involved in protecting Louis the Sixteenth, his monarchy, and sort of possibly sending military force uh, in France uh, to uh, remove the revolutionaries and put Louis back on the throne. All this did in France, however, was just uh, re inflame uh, revolutionary support uh, and uh, uh, you know, to redoubled uh, you know, many Frenchmen uh, at their loyalties uh, to the revolutionary cause. So uh, it also had the effect of causing the revolutionary government to become certain that they were going to get invaded by foreign powers, Austria uh, and possibly allies uh, as well. So there had already been some thought about that possibility anyway. They knew you know, that it, there was a chance, but now they increasingly became convinced after Pilnitz. So now we get to the radical stage uh, from 1792 to 1794, and things really start to spin out of control fairly quickly. The government got a makeover in October of 1791, uh, a, a new assembly structured somewhat differently with completely new uh, members uh, because the first national assembly that we've been talking about after it did its uh, initial work, the culmination of it being a new constitution, they had agreed that in a, a second round of legislation, none of them would uh, be allowed to run uh, or hold office. So this is a, a, a total turnover, new uh, leadership all the way around. And, and this time, uh, instead of moderates being largely in control, it's the radicals uh, that get uh, uh, control uh, uh, quite quickly. Uh, the Girondins, as they're called, you can see in the uh, bottom uh, uh, blurb there, the numbers were misleading. The Girondins quickly became the force to be reckoned with. Uh, as Ian Davidson, uh, who wrote a very recent, really good, uh, pr uh, concise book on the revolution, says, the Girondins dominated the Legislative Assembly, even though a minority. 
So they weren't the majority, but they quickly came to uh, dominate. And the Girondins at the time were the most radical group uh, in the assembly. There's a number of political parties, three major ones. You can see the, the Foyan were the middle class moderates, technically, uh, numerically had the majority, uh, but uh, not as much power. Uh, as uh, it looks uh, like on the chart on the left. Jacques Brissot uh, on the right uh, was one of the major uh, Girondin and radical leaders at the time, leader of the most radical group for now, with a, uh, a exclamation point. The for now uh, is ominous because it, you could be the most radical leader of the most radical party one day in this revolution uh, and be conservative or not radical enough because somebody outflanked you overnight, not literally, but things moved quickly here. So that heroes of the revolution uh, uh, the, day, the day before were enemies of the revolution the next day. Uh, and sure enough, we'll see the Girondins uh, don't remain uh, the most radical group for that long. Uh, but uh, as one commentator has said, this new uh, legislative assembly uh, was a hugely combustible atmosphere. The leaders were a lot younger, on average, uh, more inexperienced, and, as we said, generally more radical, uh, which means they were willing to contemplate uh, far more extreme measures uh, in trying to uh, deal with the situation, what to do with the monarchy, Louis XVI, uh, how to deal with uh, you know, the still unsolved uh, uh, long-term uh, complaints, uh, grievances of the middle class and the uh, working class uh, uh, peasants and shopkeepers, workers especially. And sure enough, uh, we can see that the revolutionary government, the Legislative Assembly, was indeed worried about being invaded by Austria because they declared war on Austria uh, in uh, 1792, uh, early on in the, in the year. Prussia then declared war on France, so Austria and Prussia were now uh, uh, at war with France. Why? And I say, don't they have enough issues in trying to consolidate a revolution already? Uh, it's a good question. Like, wait a minute. Uh, they've already bitten off possibly more than they can chew uh, by starting the revolution in the first place. France is one of the most powerful countries in the world. It's the, at the time, was the most populous country in Europe, at least west of Russia. So this was already a gigantic and uncertain undertaking. And in the middle of that, they declare war and they fight a foreign war, or at least attempt to. And the answer to that is yes. Uh, it does sound somewhat crazy, I think, to us. And it may have been. We'll see later in the class. We'll get to another revolution that has many of the same features, much of the same structures as one, the Russian Revolution in the uh, first, second decade of the 20th century. And there, the Bolshevik leader Lenin may have le learned the lesson uh, uh, the French revolutionaries hadn't learned yet, and that is, uh, and because this is what he did, in the middle of consolidating a revolution uh, is not the time to fight a, a war. Lenin got the Bolshevik communists to power, and then surrendered to uh, Germany in World War I uh, and let Germany just take a huge amount of land, more or less saying, leave us alone. We have a, a revolution to uh, take care of at home. We have to make sure that our domestic politics is in order. Uh, this revolution succeeds. We cannot be bogged down by an expensive uh, war, an expensive foreign policy. Uh, but the French leaders here uh, are now uh, doing uh, two uh, remarkably difficult things uh, uh, and expensive things at the same time. So why did they invade? Well, we know already they were in fear of being invaded first, so they thought it was inevitable, and they believed to get an, if we invade them first, it'll probably give us the element of surprise and it'll give us an upper hand. If if, if you know they were going to get invaded anyway, it might have been you know, the right move, but they couldn't have been certain of that. But there was also a couple other causes of this as well. There was a perceived need to bolster revolutionary zeal. This is now a few years into the revolution, and there apparently there, there appeared to be kind of a, a growing souring on the revolution, a certain disillusionment. People became apathetic and uh, you know uh, un unconcerned. So uh, nothing better than a foreign war to bring around patriotism. It usually works. 
And so that's kind of what they're doing here. Uh, the revolutionary government uh, trying to get the uh, the public uh, to become uh, uh, true revolutionaries again by getting them on board uh, uh, in, a, in a united cause against a foreign foe. Also, they believed that they were duty bound, uh, and they really did believe this. At least, you know, most of them, the, the leaders, that uh, they were supposed to spread revolutionary values to other countries. So they actually were so gung ho and so self righteous, certain that their values, liberty, equality, fraternity, were correct, that it's our duty, uh, they say, to export them to other countries at the you know point of a bayonet, if necessary. Uh, so uh, it sounds like strange reasoning to us, though the United States uh, has, until very recently, uh, often been sort of, uh, its foreign policy has often been led by uh, that type of thinking, that the Americans, we uh, do things uh, the right way, uh, and we're going to export them to you, whether you like it or not. This idea uh, uh, this way of thinking goes way back in, in history. It's also, by the way, possible that that can be true. It certainly is arrogant uh, and self-righteous, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's not true. Uh, in this case, it's uh, uh, debatable, uh, and we'll see that it's debatable uh, 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 either either way. When we get to Napoleon, we'll see one side of that. might surprise you. The famous German writer uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe uh, it's G-O-E-T-H-E, -E. you see at the bottom of the screen, but it's pronounced Goethe in German, like there's an R in it, but there's not. Uh, that damn German language. Uh, the first major battle uh, was with the Prussian army at a place called Valmy, on sort of near the French border. Uh, and uh, Goethe was a writer. He just happened to be along for the ride with the Prussian army, watched the battle. But he actually noticed and wrote down uh, something striking, that French troops were fighting with a, a passionate fervor, uh, and some scholars uh, see the the French Revolutionary Wars, which we're talking about now, it ended up being more than, more than one war. The other European countries got involved uh, as well, uh, basically all of them ganging up against France, uh, but a balance of power issue yet again in our class. But some see this as the beginning of kind of kind of modern ideological warfare and nationalistic uh, 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 feeling and pride. So uh, nationalism, I said one of the uh, it two, uh, two of the five isms uh, we see uh, sort of breaking out here. So almost all scholars of European history now think of the French Revolution as the beginning of modern nationalism. Uh, both the French exporting their values uh, at gunpoint uh, and uh, the backlash it gets from other peoples, the Germans, the Italians, etc., uh, later on when we get to Napoleon. So uh, this also is a prelude to what becomes known uh, later in the French Revolution, the revolutionary government putting in place through legislation, the Levé en masse, uh, which was uh, the first uh, modern uh, policy of mass conscription draft. So they drafted hundreds of thousands of troops and this is another way that you can kind of see, uh, or it can be argued, that the French Revolution produced uh, something modern uh, uh, as well, and that is sort of a, a mass modern army, uh, again, fighting with you know, zeal for a cause, uh, a political philosophy or value system. Americans fight for liberty, uh, etc. And this, this was partly about liberty uh, as well. So the revolution... Uh, exports uh, its values or tries to through a foreign war and uh, it also uses that war to try to uh, revive or increase uh, nationalistic uh, uh, spirit. The Paris Commune, uh, formed in 1792, became the local government of Paris, the city hall uh, of Paris, uh, uh, and uh, it becomes a crucial element in this revolution, as we'll see. The Jacobin clubs kind of associated with them, their leaders uh, tend to be the same people uh, and have the same political views. Uh, the Jacobins uh, are the group that's going to become the most radical political party. These weren't formal political parties per se, but we'll call them that. Uh, but the Jacobins uh, were about to outflank the Girondins, 
uh, and send them packing uh, as the most radical group. But the Jacobin clubs were kind of private clubs, and they, they had them around uh, France, not just in Paris. It was kind of like a Toastmasters, but it was almost all politics. So people made speeches, and they had speakers come, and uh, they debate uh, various issues uh, for a while. Pretty soon it became people uh, only allowed to say what is accepted uh, dogma uh, for the revolutionary cause. So the government of Paris uh, on the commune side, uh, uh, Jacobin clubs kind of united, related uh, to them. Um, both of these ended up being alternate political strongholds uh, during the revolution which is a, a sign and, and, and a, a symptom that the revolution, uh, the government was unstable because having kind of a shadow government, which this kind of became, uh, having basically, in essence, two governments uh, is a, a recipe for disaster and a recipe for, you know, obviously ongoing instability. It can't be healthy for a, a, a country of people to have two governments trying to claim their loyalty. And it does, uh, it is a bit odd because this is local government, but it is in the capital city. So what, what happens is that uh, shrewd radical politicians, particularly uh, radicals who had sat in the National Assembly, but remember are prohibited from sitting in the Le Legislative Assembly, the next iteration of uh, the government, uh, but they still want to be involved in politics and still think they have, you know, something to uh, contribute and want power. So they realize, well, we can maybe find another power base. And they sure enough find it in local governments, Paris Commune and the Jack Jacobin clubs. But they their support, uh, uh, because the, the Jacobin clubs uh, are, and the Commune has, uh, both of them have uh, offices and buildings kind of around the city in various neighborhoods. So they're, they're really close to the people, these politicians. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, in actual proximity to them. Uh, which helps them uh, to uh, get a, a loyal following uh, of many uh, Parisians, uh, what become quickly known as the sans culottes, uh, which means without pants. It does mean that. It doesn't mean without pants, it means without knee breeches. In, in uh, those days, you've seen this in the movies and TV shows, gentlemen or the upper class, nobles or uh, knee breeches and tights underneath, stockings. And average people wore pants, uh, right, uh, uh, like like we do. So what uh, sans culottes means without knee breeches. So the, the it was a statement made by the revolutionaries that say we're, we're not going to try to you know any longer copy the nobility and dress like them. We're going to dress uh, intentionally, you know, the other way. Uh, so uh, you were not allowed to wear uh, knee breeches. That's really true. Uh, but how they got that sort of attached to them as their name, I'm not entirely sure. But the sans culottes are the, at least the radical, very politically involved, uh, uh, sort of pushy, uh, uh, persuasive, influential uh, group of Parisians. Uh, and uh, they come to be really, really loyal uh, to the Paris Commune uh, Jacobin clubs and the Jacobin leaders that take control of them and uh, become the... Uh, un, uh, the uh, not official, unofficial, <laughs> I couldn't think of the word unofficial, uh, leaders uh, of the, the sans culottes. So these politicians were had been out of office. They find a way back in uh, through local government, but they're so powerful because they have so much support from the public, uh, kind of from the bottom up, that they start to rival the national government and the legislative assembly just from uh, local government institutions. So it is a bizarre situation, uh, even kind of hard to explain, as you can uh, hear. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, need to, I need to take a sip of my uh, Coke. Any more caffeine? Excuse me. By the summer of 1792, uh, there was, quote, uh, a sudden shift of power from the bourgeois revolutionaries in the assembly, in the middle class moderates, to the sans culottes and the commune. Uh, so, leaders like uh, Robespierre and Danton are going to meet uh, radical Jacobins. Uh, uh, this is where they sort of get their uh, base of support, which launches them upward, uh, uh, eventually to the height uh, of power uh, in the revolution. Um, that comes from, uh, again, Ian Davidson's recent book. Uh, 
in the same uh, book, later passages, the Jacobin Club was the thought police of the revolution. If the Jacobins believed some new doctrine that was the required orthodoxy and to protest against it, oh, if, if they believed some doctrine, that was the required orthodoxy and the protest against it was to risk expulsion from the club, which could easily be the first step towards being denounced to the Revolutionary Tribunal. What's not said there is the further step beyond that that was possible was getting your head lopped off uh, uh, by the guillotine. So uh, I said these were debating clubs at first, but by the time it became thought police uh, oriented, you weren't really allowed to say anything uh, but what was accepted dogma and doctrine. Davidson also says, the crowd power of the commune brought down the Girondins. So uh, by doing an end run around the national legislative assembly, national governments, Jacobin leaders like Robespierre, uh, all right, uh, going around them by establishing control of local institutions like the commune and the Jacobin clubs, uh, took the first step to bringing the Girondin down, which they did uh, also within the legislative assembly from there. So this all, this very uh, tumultuous, unclear situation, must have been confusing to anyone and everyone involved, was a wicked symbiosis between Jacobin leaders uh, and the sans culottes. So they're now kind of married together, uh, both kind of uh, helping each other out. Uh, and this isn't an actual conversation, but I'm simplifying for, for, for you. To help us understand how this revolution spun increasingly out of control, how it got in more and more irrational, more and more crazy uh, from this point forward. And it does. It's not just, doesn't just get crazy. It keeps moving uh, uh, in an uh, outrageous direction. So the mob, uh, which is a negative term, but the, for the people of Paris, the sans uh are saying to leaders like Robespierre uh, on the right, Danton on the left, Marat in the middle, if you get extreme, we'll support you. What does the leader do? Gets more extreme. Uh, then the mob says, well done. Now if you get even more extreme, we'll continue to support you. What does the leader do? Gets even more extreme. Uh, the mob, uh, excellent. Now we're getting somewhere. And if you get as extreme as possible, we'll keep supporting you. Leader gets as extreme as possible. Uh, and what you see uh, partially happening here is Jacobin leaders themselves uh, getting involved in, they're, they were in the same party but they start to score off against each other and compete for power. Uh, the guys on left and right, again, Danton on the left, Rose Pierre on the right, and another guy not pictured named Jacques Hébert. All three of them become kind of popular heroes and have a following amongst the sans-culottes. And it actually comes down to, in the end, them trying to get rid of each other uh, to keep uh, themselves sort of at the head or make themselves sort of the leader of the Jacobins overall. And so Robespierre actually outduels uh, Danton and Hébert eventually. How? He went further, in quote, enlisting the street power of the sans-culottes, which is Ian Davidson's nicer way of saying uh, what I was kind of trying to get at uh, above, uh, and that is uh, really whichever leader uh, agreed to and followed through with doing the bidding of the sans-culottes, doing what they wanted, more and more extreme, uh, uh, that's the guy that got the power. That's the guy that got their support and then was able to use that support to push the other guys aside and even get rid of them uh, as both Aber and Danton are eventually executed uh, at the hands of Robespierre, uh, his uh, allies, uh, and control of the government. Uh, so w what are the extreme measures? Well, they're kind of two, two things. The mob wants more and more blood. Uh, another sign that this revolution is out of control. There's just this frenzy uh, for revenge, to avenge, you know, a, a long, uh, you know, long-held anger uh, and frustration uh, at the nobility, uh, at uh, sort of anybody, you know, wealthy uh, from the poor people of Paris. So they're reveling in the chance to kind of uh, turn things over, uh, turning the world upside down. They're on top, and now they have formerly powerful rich people you know, shaking in their boots uh, with their own power. So one of the things that sort of ups uh, extremes, increases extremes, uh, is more bloodshed. So if you're a politician that promises them more bloodshed, 
you're going to get their support. Uh, now I'm simplifying, but that's by and large true. The second element in being more extreme uh, is uh, agreeing to uh, uh, push uh, uh, either in uh, local government or at the national level uh, in the same place, Paris, more extreme economic policies, redistribution of wealth, uh, right? Uh, so this is actually the beginnings in many ways of uh, modern socialism, the other uh, of the two isms that we meet here for the first time. Uh, the, the, some of them want a, a complete, some, and we'll see one at the end of the lecture, revolutionary leaders uh, want a complete uh, abolishing of private property uh, and sort of economic equality across across the board. That's very extreme, so that's kind of at the bottom, as extreme as possible. But it kind of climbs the ladder in that direction as these leaders, whether or not they really supported socialist ideas or uh, you know, economic uh, redistribution uh, or not is not entirely clear. Uh, uh, what is clear is that they used it uh, uh, to rise the ladder of power uh, and to eliminate both politically and sometimes, uh, uh, you know, violently their their rivals. So with this new radical group, sans culottes, sort of driving from the bottom with willing uh, leaders who want power, like Robespierre and Marat, the revolution gets uh, more and more violent uh, and uh, spins uh, further and further uh, out of any semblance of control. Uh, by the summer of 1792, uh, uh, Parisians uh, were uh, in a state of uh, anxiety and fear, uh, paranoid, partly because uh, the uh, other powers fighting France from outside were pushing, uh, and after the Battle of Valmy, uh, had started to win the wars against France, and they were m moving closer to Paris. They didn't get to uh, Paris, by the way, uh, in the end, but nobody could know at the time. So part of what happens next year, the storming of the Tuileries, uh, was driven by fear. Uh, and what happened on June 20th, 1792, a mass of prisons, sans culottes, stormed the royal palace. Uh, the king and queen had numerous royal palaces. This was one of them, uh, and uh, it was stormed uh, with apparent intent to harm them, not kill them. Uh, keep in mind, we're still in a situation at this point where, at least technically speaking, the uh, revolutionary government uh, is has pledged itself, the constitution in place is pledged to establishing a constitutional monarchy. However, after the flight to Varennes, we know that the king wasn't trusted any longer, so uh, there, there was a great deal of debate about this amongst the revolutionary political leaders. Uh, are we still going to have a constitutional monarchy, or do we need to uh, you know, make some other arrangements and do more drastic things? Well, this was certainly a drastic thing to do. Uh, breaking in by force a, a, an unruly mob, some members of the National Guard, sans culottes, shopkeepers, uh, uh, you know, radicalized by events uh, and fighting with the Swiss Guard. Again, that group uh, of soldiers, elite uh, trained soldiers, their whole job was to protect the uh, royal family. Uh, the crowd massacred 800 Swiss Guard uh, when all was said and done. And it's clear in retrospect now that this wasn't just a spontaneous eruption, uh, however much fear and paranoia was in the air. This was instigated by leaders like Robes Robespierre and Marat. But the royal family was already gone. Uh, they lucked out there, or you know, this revolution would have had a different ending to it, uh, or at least the timing would have been different. Uh, Davidson again saying the sans culottes were now in charge. This would not last, but it was a clear sign that the world was changing. And the central fact in this changing world was that the French revolutionaries had crossed the fatal frontier into illegality. So the government now, or at least the guys who were about to become the government leaders, uh, Robespierre being the first and foremost of them, are, are now engaging in not just illegal acts, uh, but immoral, grossly immoral uh, act acts. So this becomes a criminal government increasingly going going forward. Uh, and this is the the way that a left-leaning, and this, again, conflict is moving further and further to the left, further towards socialism, 
These kind of socialists in the modern world, communist revolutions, uh, often have this sort of element to them. They get to a point where the leadership uh, increasingly relies on force, increasingly breaks laws, increasingly does underhanded things, increasingly takes uh, more and more power into their own hands uh, and uh, you know, defies their own uh, promises uh, of equality, freedom, democracy, etc., etc., and sure enough, uh, this is a model uh, of that uh, type of development. Next, uh, showing that uh, uh, this uh, is not anywhere close to being over, I don't mean this lecture, but that's kind of true too, sadly for you, but uh, this whole crisis are the September massacres in September uh, of the same year. So just after the a storming of the Tuileries, uh, Paris still gripped by fear and paranoia, uh, we see uh, another bloody event occur. Uh, I'll uh, let Professor Perry uh, take us the rest of the way on this. As rumors spread that jailed priests and aristocrats were planning to break out of their cells to support enemy forces outside Paris, none of which was true, uh, Parisians panicked, driven by fear, uh, by fear patriotism, and murderous impulses, they raided prisons on, and after an improvised popular court determined the accused's fate, uh, uh, largely on the basis of appearance, uh, and hammered and hacked to death 1,200 prisoners, including more than 200 priests. Most of the victims were not political prisoners, but just ordinary criminals, except for the priests. Why were so many priests in jail? Well, by this time, and this also displays the radicalism of the revolution, the revolutionary leaders were increasingly trying to push uh, traditional religion away uh, and trying to get rid of traditional Catholicism in, in France. Not to be replaced by Protestantism, but to be replaced by nothing or some type of secular religion. Or uh, you could see the ideology, uh, the political ideology of the revolution here uh, as a substitute religion, at least for those buying into it. By the way, the September massacres were also uh, uh, orchestrated, most likely, uh, by the upcoming radical Jacobin leaders, egging on the sans culottes. So the revolution lurches to the left uh, on the streets, but also uh, in uh, politics as well. We see another makeover here, a third uh, legislative body. So we started with the National Assembly, 1789. Uh, then came the Legislative Assembly that got more radical, uh, from moderate to radical. And now the National Convention uh, is the uh, the new government uh, and sort of is a new group of people, uh, political leaders elected. Uh, and now we see uh, the ultra-radical leaders, as you could call them, mainly the Jacobins, take power. Sometimes they're referred to as the, the mountain as well, which has something to do with uh, this kind of virtual hill that was in the, the building where they met, kind of upstairs. Uh, so uh, I, I say at the top, uh, or state, uh, why these kind of revolutions tend to eat their young. And again, by these kind, I mean the left-leaning revolutions, so socialist-leaning revolutions, which we'll see more of in this class, particularly the Russian one, but there are others. Uh, why do they tend to eat their young? Well, there are a number of reasons, and, and it's kind of we're putting together a number of threads here that we've been uh, dealing with somewhat separately. Remember that in the first phase of the revolution, the moderate phase, the middle class and the working class and the peasants all were on the same side uh, for somewhat different reasons, but what united them was hatred for the government, the nobility, and the policies that har harmed them and always benefited the nobility. Well, after the moderate phase was over, the middle class had achieved basically what they needed and wanted. So they wanted the revolution to uh, stop. Uh, and the working class and the peasants are saying, we're just getting started. We're just getting warmed up. What do you mean stop? So by the end of 1791, uh, many of the middle class moderates have sort of jumped off the bandwagon uh, and are no longer, uh, uh, you know, they've gotten what they want. Uh, uh, they've, they've achieved... Uh, enough uh, legal uh, freedoms uh, with the Constitution that was written uh, that the, a lot of their problems were, were ended. So the working class, the peasantry, uh, some of the middle class were still, however, not satisfied. 
And so they uh, see the chance here because of the developments we've been talking about to radically change France further in their favor. I'm not saying up until this point the poor hadn't gotten any, anything out of the revolution, but they certainly hadn't gotten as much as the middle class. So they were right about that. Uh, but it's what they were willing to do, how far they're willing to go, uh, you know, what they're willing to do to, to, to make this happen uh, that makes this uh, a bloodthirsty, uh, uh, you know, a criminal uh, and ex extreme uh, extravaganza of violence uh, when we're right in the middle of it already. It gets worse. Political leaders uh, see, uh, and these are mostly, again, middle class political leaders. Robespierre was from a middle class background, so he's not one of the working class. Educated, middle class, came from some means, but a handful of leaders like Robespierre see the the anger, uh, the you know, uh, the radical ideology or the radical beliefs, wanting to redistribute wealth, uh, you know, uh, equally. Uh, however, uh, you know, however it's done, they see this as an opportunity to get power, uh, to climb the ladder of power. So this is where the again we've already said it uh, on an earlier slide, but there's kind of a marriage between the uh, sans culottes uh, of Paris. Uh, and this handful of Jacobin leaders uh, that are willing to sort of do whatever they want, uh, uh, the, but the sans wants want uh, to achieve their own uh, goals, power. Uh, and uh, uh, it's Robespierre, as we know, that sort of outdid everybody else, but uh, that was, you know, it took some time. I jumped ahead a little bit there. Uh, so the winners are always those willing to go the farthest in carrying out the people's demands for redistribution of wealth uh, and for blood, also already mentioned. Which brings us to Jean-Paul Marat, uh, one of the uh, most interesting figures of all in this revolution, uh, but also one of the most unstable, uh, and maybe just downright crazy, certainly fanatical. Uh, the revolution's most incendiary and widely read journalist. Uh, so uh, he uh, eventually made his way by election into the uh, assembly uh, itself, uh, and became a fanatical, radical Jacobin politician. He edited a paper, uh, his own paper, called Friend of the People, uh, which was constantly harangued, before he was a politician, haranguing uh, the nobility, uh, the uh, ruling class, the, the monarchy, basically whoever was in power at, at the time until he came to power. Uh, he uh, used extremely violent uh, editorial language, run a sword through them, the executioner's axe is waiting and will punish him for his crimes. So uh, his paper was always filled with not only extreme ideas, uh, but violent uh, imagery uh, and language. We see on the on the right... <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, we see on the right uh, a famous, very famous uh, painting uh, of uh, Jean-Paul Marat. Uh, I'm sorry, the death of Jean-Paul Marat. Uh, 